Welcome to Level Review, where we critique and analyze levels from classic Nintendo games. We're not here to review the entire game. Instead, each video will focus on a single level. We want to break down what makes an individual level fun or memorable. What makes it stick out in our minds years later? Whether that be good memories, or not so good. But today, I want to talk to you about a game whose level design will physically make you weep. It'll make you look at other games with disgust and make you think this is the only game for you. That game, of course, is Banjo-Kazooie. Over the next couple months, we'll be breaking down each level of this fantastic game. But for today, let's start at the beginning. Let's take a look at where one of gaming's most iconic duos began their journey. No, fuck! Oh my god, no! The level I'm of course talking about is the magnificent, the majestic, and some might say, mediocre, Mumbo's Mountain. Okay, let's start with the basics. At its core, Banjo-Kazooie is a 3D platformer, specifically, a collectathon, which basically means, as the player, you're gonna be collecting a lot of shit. In Banjo-Kazooie, that shit includes jiggies, notes, jingos, and honeycomb pieces. Now, for a collectathon to be great, it has to present you with interesting ways to obtain these collectibles in a setting that's fun to explore. And Banjo Kazooie does just that. It has levels that may do this better than any 3D platformer. Levels that are filled with a childlike wonder that will make the player question their very existence by the end. However, Mumbo's Mountain is not one of those levels. The only thing that Mumbo's Mountain makes me question is whether or not to pull the trigger. Okay, maybe that was a little harsh, but Mumbo's Mountain at its core is bland and uninspired. I'll go into why I think that is, but first, let's do a quick overview of the level. So, like every other Banjo-Kazooie level, Mumbo's Mountain has 10 jiggies, 100 notes, and 5 jinjos to collect. These can be found in Mumbo Mountain's many locations, like Termite Hill, the Mountain Hillside, outside Mumbo's Skull, this Stonehenge impersonation, and the tree where this dickhead hangs out. Honestly, this monkey can suck a banana-sized dick. I cannot tell you how many times he killed my ass as an 8-year-old. Okay, so now you've seen the many locales of Mumbo's Mountain. Next, let's check out the Jiggies. You have this one in Mumbo's Skull's eye socket, this one from busting up this hut, this one sitting atop a pedestal, one from getting all the Jinjos, one for completing Fucknut's orange minigame, another one for feeding a chimp an orange, another one for shooting Fucknut's in, well, the nuts, one sitting atop this hillside ledge, one from this totem pole minigame, and the last is atop this termite hill that you have to scale. So, I don't know if you noticed, but three out of the ten jiggies in this level you can get by literally just walking up and grabbing them. You don't have to do anything. You just walk right up and grab them. And this right here is my main issue with Mumbo's Mountain. It's just too easy. You can 100% this entire level in under 30 minutes on your first playthrough. It's the definition of a cakewalk. And I know what you're gonna say. It's the game's first level. It's supposed to be easy. It's supposed to teach players how to play the game. And to that I say, there's easy. And then there's Mumbo's Mountain, baby's first platformer easy. Take the first level of Mario 64, for example. Nobody would describe Bob on Battlefield as a hard level. It's honestly pretty easy as well, but it's still fun. Let's look at the level's first star, Big Bob Bomb on the Summit, so I can show you. To get this star, you have to run past this horrifying chain chomp, through this pit, up a mountain that's dropping iron balls on your ass, and then you have to defeat a boss at the top. All this just for the first star of the game. Compare this now to the jiggy that most players get first in Mumbo Mountain. You walk up the hillside, get to the skull, backflip, and you're done. There's virtually no obstacle in your way here. It's honestly quite lazy. And I get it, the purpose of the first level is to teach a player the mechanics of the game, and to give them an idea on how the game is supposed to work. The problem with Mumbo's Mountain though, it's that it's at odds with this very philosophy. It teaches you you can just stumble into Jiggies just lying around and grab them without any pushback. Which honestly, just isn't true. Every other Jiggy in the game requires some kind of exploration or challenge to be conquered. But no, 
Mumbles Mountain insists on treating you like Helen Keller playing your first 3D platformer. So, even though Mumbles Mountain is insultingly easy, it fails to teach you how the game is going to be played going forward. But that's not even the worst part. This level, Mumbles Mountain, has been hiding a dark secret. A secret so dark, so insidious, that it would shake the very core of society if it was ever uttered. And that secret is... That Mumbo's Mountain isn't even a fucking mountain! Hey! The level should be called Mumbo's Slight Incline. Like, look at this and tell me that this is a mountain. You can scale this puppy in like 5 seconds. I don't know about you, but any mountain you can climb in 5 seconds isn't a mountain. It's a hill. And I bet you Mumbo's like going to parties and shit, and like telling everybody he lives on a mountain? Mumbo's totally that guy who says he works at a university, and implies that he's a professor, when he's really just a janitor. And don't even try to pin it on the limitations of the N64. There are plenty of games that did mountains way better on the system. Like Orcarina of Time or Mystical Ninja. Okay, I went a little off the rails there. Honestly though, I really don't hate the level that much. It actually does have some redeeming qualities. Like the totem pole minigame is pretty fun. Smashing these huts is satisfying. Shooting an egg straight down monkey futz urethra is always great. And climbing the termite mound is awesome. Damn. I haven't even talked about the transformations yet. So, in every level, Mumble will transform the player character into some kind of creature that pertains to the level's theme. In Freeze Easy Peak, it's a walrus. In TikTok Woods, it's a bee. In Mumbo's Mountain, it's a fucking termite. Because this level has no cohesive theme at all. Like, it's on a mountain. There's a monkey on a tree. A bull. Ancient ruins. Tiki Hut. And the transformation is a termite. It's just a mess. And just as you would expect, the termite is just as pathetic as it sounds. It has no means of attack, and its special ability is being able to climb up steep slopes. That's it. That's all it could do. You really only need it for one jiggy, and that's it. It's honestly fitting though. A tire fire transformation for a tire fire level. Honestly, this review came out way harsher than I thought it would. Compared to levels in most 3D platformers, Mumbo's Mountain is not a bad level at all. The problem is, when you compare it to levels in a game as good as Banjo Kazooie, it sticks out like a sore thumb. Most of the jiggy challenges in the level are far too easy and border on the line of lazy. They also do a poor job at teaching new players what they can expect from the game going forward. There are some fun elements to the level, but the whole experience is brought down by a lack of cohesive theme and interesting areas to explore. It's not great, but it's not horrible either. That's why I'm hitting Mumbo's Mountain with a C rating. Also, it's not a fucking mountain! Shh. Do you hear that? Listen closely. The waves, the breeze, and a shark bite? It could also be my really loud computer. But the first three sounds can only be heard in what might be one of the best worlds in the Banjo series. It's none other than Treasure Trove Cove. Now continuing on with our list of reviewing Banjo-Kazooie levels, we leave the high mountains of Mumbo and make our way to the glorious beaches of Treasure Trove Cove. As I said, this may possibly be one of the best games in the Banjo-Kazooie series. Well, yeah, World Series. World Series. From the crystal blue waters, clear open skies, and shimmering sand, almost everything about this world invites you in. It also makes you want to have a drink, which I'm definitely doing right now. Hmm. I wish I had a straw so I could slurp. Well, almost everything is inviting about this world. Any fan knows that the ocean water comes with some dangers in the form of Snack of the Shark. But what's a world without some danger? In addition to Snacker, you got Nibber, the giant crab, who doesn't who doesn't name their crab. <laughs> In addition to Snacker, you got Nibber, the giant crab, because who doesn't name their crabs? Some sea mines and some chests with teeth. But overall, the danger level is low, which leaves you with a lot of time to take in every experience of this world. Unlike Mumbo Mountain, you do have to work for some of these jiggies. One of the jiggies can be rewarded to you when you get to play hero and help Captain and Blubber find his treasure in the ship. I don't know about you, but I get major bottom vibes from Blubber. 
Another Jiggy you can only get after defeating your crabs, I mean, uh, Nipper the Giant Crab. All you gotta do is avoid his sharp claws and hit his eyes three times. Then next thing you know, you find out what it's like to be inside Nipper. All in a hard day's work collecting Jiggies, right? This world also requires some thinking. Yes, actual thinking, I know. To get a Jiggy. I don't know about most kids these days, but I think it took me a while to grasp that you had to essentially shit eggs into this bucket to drain the water around the sandcastle. Once inside the sandcastle, you better hope you're not illiterate, because you will be required to spell out Banjo-Kazooie using the Beak Buster. You could also just look at the case that you, you know, bought the game on, but who still has that anyways? I wish I still did. Love treasure hunts? Well, X certainly marks the spot for this Jiggy. Just follow the X's, five of them to be exact. Once all five X's have been pounded with Kazooie's Beak Buster, you'll see a question mark. Don't fret, the final X is located on a small aisle nearby, and so a little lockup once you pound this final X. <laughs> little lockup is just begging me to unlock him. And for my personal favorite Jiggy, waiting on top of the lighthouse. And yes I know, Jiggy's just out in the open are pretty easy, but this one comes with a view of the entire world, and it's hard to resist not standing there and taking it all in. Nothing but the breeze and the temptation to jump off and end it all. This world also comes with two huge moves. Huge. I mean, big. The Shock Jump Spring, which allows Banjo and Kazooie to jump to new heights and areas that would previously be inaccessible. And of course, the flying ability. If you haven't flown the open skies of Treasure Trove Cove, then you haven't lived. And this is definitely the best way to get around this world. And I didn't even mention the best part of the world. The music. No level would be complete without great music and Treasure Trove Cove shows that it's a big contender in that department as well. And yes, I recognize the music in this video is the Super Smash Bros. Ultimate Edition, but it truly is a classic and makes you want to spend as much time in this world as possible. I was always sad when I was finished this world and had to leave. I guess I'll send a postcard next time. I can't say enough great things about this world. I can go on and on and on and on, and one day, when there's the technology that will allow you to visit any video game land or world, you better believe Treasure Trove Cove is on my list. I give Treasure Trove Cove an S. <sighs> Which is fitting how the world is just jam-packed with sun, sand, and sea. What do you think? Do you agree Treasure Trove Cove is also an S-rated world? Where would you rank it amongst the rest in the Banjo-Kazooie series? Let us know down below. Until next time. We've already reviewed the mediocre trash heap that is Mumbo's Mountain and the absolute treasure that is Treasure Trove Cove. Next up though, is a level so nasty, so filthy, that even Lindsay Lohan stays away from it. That level is the sexy, the seductive, Clanker's Cavern. Now, I'll try and say this in the most delicate way possible. Clanker's Cavern is fucked! Take a look at this shit, it's a horror show. There's spinning blades of death, mutant crabs, bondage chains? Hmm, okay, that one's kinda hot. And to top it off, we have the mayor of this horror show from hell, Clanker. Clanker is a mechanical whale shark thing that Gwentilda the Witch conveniently uses as her trash compactor. Just look at this fucking thing, it's an abomination. Like I'm not even sure what's going on here, is this thing alive? It has like open wounds and shit. What kind of E-rated Nintendo game has gore like this? Apparently fucking Banjo-Kazooie. Uh -huh. I mean it comes from the same franchise that thought it was cool to have a fornicating penis as part of the level design or a gay bar with sexually suggestive food items. Let's be honest, you ain't seen Clanker Mario 64. And you better not be seeing Seaman's fucking surprise. Whoa! So, aside from being an assault on all five senses, Clanker's actually a pretty cool guy. I know the level's called Clanker's Cavern, but Clanker himself is the centerpiece of the level. Everything you do in the level revolves around Clanker. The first thing you have to do with custy old Clanker is to loosen off his chain, so he can float above the hepatitis water that inhabits his cavern. To do this, you have to swim down and turn his key three times. Sounds easy, right? Wrong. So wrong. Because while you're doing this, your air meter is dropping every second. And it's a long way down. 
and turning this key is a bitch. The hitbox is super wonky, and the underwater controls on Banjo-Kazooie are complete ass. This nice little fish drops air bubbles for you that refill your air meter. But the bubbles are that classic N64 2D fucking JPEG in a 3D world, so it's impossible to judge where they are accurately. So, you end up swimming around like a jackass trying to collect these bubbles just to die anyways. So, once you loosen Clanker off from his set's dungeon restraints, he floats to the surface of his glorious cavern. And this is where the level gets interesting. Just the act of having Clanker surface above the diarrhea water completely opens up the level. It allows you to grab this jiggy just sitting on Clanker's back. Which, I'm actually okay with, because unlike this atrocity in Mumbo's Mountain, you actually have to work for it. It also allows you to reach a jiggy in a higher section of the level by running up Clanker's tail. I know it looks easy, but running up Clanker's tail takes more dexterity than balancing three bouncy balls on your butt sheets. Another section it opens up is this pipe pathway, which you get by riding this bolt that's launched out of Clanker's blowhole. Figuring out you can ride on the bolt is such a cool moment. As soon as Clanker surfaces, you see it shooting off in the distance. And then, you approach it and think to yourself, what happens if I stand right here? And then it blasts you off into fucking space! And you're just like, YES! VIDEO GAMES! And believe it or not, this is not even the coolest thing you could do with Clanker's blowhole. Because like all good holes, you can go inside it. And this right here is Clanker's Cavern's Mona Lisa. The moment you realize there's a whole other section of the level inside Clanker's mechanical husk of a body is the moment you realize this level is something special. And again, you're sitting there like, video games, come on. This is too much. Come on, video games. So, when you first enter Clanker's Cavern, it may seem small at first glance. But as soon as you raise Clanker up from the raw sewage, it completely changes the level in such a fun and creative way. Using Clanker's body parts to access different parts of the level, and having his insides actually become part of the level, is just so fucking cool. And honestly, I've been dying to talk about Clanker's insides. So, ladies and gentlemen, let's lube up and dive right in. So, if you thought the outside of a Clanker was bad, then you clearly haven't seen his insides. Clinker's insides are a nightmarish hellscape. It's wet, bloody, and just overall icky, icky, icky. And he has these tentacles sprouting up everywhere, which honestly, you should have someone take a look at. Overall, it's not the nastiest thing I've been inside, but it's up there. So, aside from the disturbing decor, Clanker's inside houses a number of challenges that will reward you with some jiggies. This ring minigame in Clanker's belly is especially fun. There's also a section where you have to use the golden feathers to bypass the spinning blades of doom, which I can only assume are used to grind up Gruntilda's nasty trash. Poor Clanker, man. He doesn't even know he's just a glorified guard raider. So taken out of context, these little minigames that take place inside Clanker don't seem that great. I know. But that's just it. It's the context itself that makes them so fucking cool. You're not just swimming through rings. You're swimming through rings in the belly of a fucking mechanical whale shark straight from fucking hell. If you don't think that's awesome, I don't want to see what you're into. Side note. Have you ever noticed there's a weird amount of really good N64 games that involve sections where the player goes inside of a whale? Orgarina of Time? Paper Mario? Banjo-Kazooie? The list goes on and on. Aspiring game developers take notes. If you want to make a good game, just add in a whale section. Apparently, it's just that easy. So, when it comes down to it, Clanker's Cavern is just a really awesome level. It has everything you would want in a banjo level. It's got fun jiggies, it's got an awesome world to explore, it's got a clanker, it's got kinky sets dungeon chains. Hmm, yeah it does. But seriously, it's the atmosphere that really brings this level together. It's just so unique and disturbing. The first two levels in banjo are just so bright and colorful. They're like your mom bringing you hot chocolate and wrapping you in a warm blanket. And then you hit Clanker's Cavern, 
This level is like nothing else in the game. Banjo-Kazooie actually has a horror-themed level, but it's really just a fucking lie. Because Clanker's Cavern puts that shit to shame. And let's not forget about Clanker, the star of the show. The bell of the fucking ball. And the reason this level is so great. Just having him integrate into the exploration of the level makes Clanker's Cavern feel so unique when compared to other 3D platformers. I can't say I've ever played a game that uses a mechanical whale shark dumpster thing to alter and change a level, and for that reason alone, I'm giving Clanker's Cavern an A. Welcome back to Levels Review, where we review your favorite and not so favorite levels. Banjo Kazooie has always been a series that has provided its audience with a diverse selection of worlds to experience. So far, we've seen the mountains, the beaches, and a creepy cavern. Each world offers their own unique experiences when it comes to picking the right vacation destination. And Hanny, do I have the vacation package for you in this video. Now I'll be honest, this isn't the best vacation package I've tried to sell, but goddammit I'm going to try. So pack your bug spray and get out your best camo and get ready to travel to Bubble Gloop Swamp. Now I know what you're thinking, who the hell would want a vacation in a swamp? And to that I'd say probably this family, or this guy. But if that doesn't convince you, let's break down this world and go over every experience you could have. First off, in this world you can learn the stilt stride. This move allows you to strap on these designer boots and gives you the ability to strut your tall legs throughout the piranha filled swamp water. You've never looked better baby. Now I'll be the first to admit that this world is not the most appealing. It's somewhat gloomy, way too much green, and just not the most exciting to navigate through. Truthfully, the two major ways to get through this world is with these sexy boots, or having a high level of balance. But life's about balance, right? And it's certainly the case if you like to collect jiggies, because for two of these jiggies, you must use your beak bust on the jiggy switches and cross these thin and narrow paths to collect jiggies within time constraints. But trust in your skill set, and you should be just fine. One thing I highly recommend doing early in your vacation is dropping off your stupid kids at this turtle daycare. Doesn't matter what your kid is, they will take kids of all creatures and sizes. Here they can also practice their musical ability, and if you decide to practice as well, you'll be awarded with a jiggy. But in order to even get access to this daycare, you have to smash Tank Top's feet. This giant turtle is a godlike character in these swamps, but don't worry. He's also kinky, and loves when tourists smash his feet. The harder the better, and if you do it well, you'll be awarded with another jiggy. Now that you're kid free, it's time to get crazy. One of Bubble- <laughs> One of Bubble Gloop Swamp's best excursions is the colorful poisonous frogs. They are the swamp's national anthem, and they are also endangered, and so there are high penalties if they are injured. It's actually been a while since anyone has seen them, so we we're thinking they might be hibernating right now, and definitely not extinct. Next, visit the local villagers and see the tree huts. This swamp gets its rich history from the locals, and they are the reason there is so much culture here. They are so loving and kind, and I know they've spent months building these huts, and so it would really be a shame if someone did something to disturb the peace. Remember Tank Tub the Giant Turtle? Well, this is his egg. The local villagers pray to this giant egg every morning. It truly is the heart of Bubble Gloop Swamp, and breaking or damaging this egg in any way would really have an impact on the swamp. That's why respect is so important, and we hope anyone traveling to this world has it. Now, as part of this once in a lifetime vacation package, you'll also have the chance to meet the mayor of Bubble Gloop Swamp, Mumbo. Now, being the successful businessman he is, Mumbo is your guide for anything related to real estate. He has multiple vacation homes throughout the Banjo series, and even bought his own mountain back in 1984. You go, Mumbo. Now, Mumbo loves skills, so another activity that the whole family can participate in is our daily skull scavenger hunt. Scattered throughout this swamp, you'll find multiple skulls, and if you collect enough, Mumbo will grant you one wish. Here's a clip and a testimonial from one of our most recent clients, who wish was granted and just absolutely loves spending his honeymoon in Bubble Glue Swamp. Hey y'all, I recently had my honeymoon in Bubble Gloop Swamp, and OMG, I feel like a new person. I heard about this Mumbo character being able to grant wishes, and I knew immediately I had to take my chance to see him. The thing is, I've just always wanted to be a crocodile. 
And so once I got my tent skulls, I skirted away from my wife and went straight to Mumbo. And boom, I was a crocodile with a new outlook on life. Suddenly, I could travel through the swamp water without fear of being bitten or injured. I was planning on returning back to my human self and my wife, but then I came across Mr. Vile and found new love in my new crocodile form. Mr. Vile was so quick to show who was the boss in this relationship, but I was also quick to show him I was the hungriest by eating an all-you-eat kind of buffet of yumbies and crumblies. <laughs> We've been inseparable ever since. Thanks, Level Reviews, for recommending this great vacation package. It was our pleasure. Listen, if you want my honest opinion, I find Bubble Glue Swamp to be just fine. It's nothing special, and visually, it's not appealing to travel through. If you're looking for a challenge, this isn't the world for you, since collecting all the collectibles in this world is pretty easy. But there are some interesting things you can do. I personally love the memorizing of tip top songs, and though I'm not a fan of Mr. Vile's eating minigame, it's a pretty unique activity, especially since you have to do it while transformed. But hey, if you love green and moss, and don't mind these annoying ass bugs, then this just might be the world for you. I give Bubble Gloop Swamp a B. So, as every gamer knows, there's only five different themes that a game developer can choose from when creating a level. You got your basic grassland, you got your fire level, you got your underwater theme, you got your poop worlds, and finally, you have what might be my absolute favorite of them all, the snow world. And there is one snow world in particular that stands out above the rest. An ultimate authority on all things cold. A true king in the north, you might say. Brr, button up your jacket, because today we're reviewing Freeze Easy Peak, baby! Okay. Okay! I'll just come out and say it. I think Freeze Easy Peak is the best level in Banjo-Kazooie. Maybe in the franchise. All you Mumbo's mountain lovers out there, take note because this is what a real level looks like. <laughs> I'm kidding, there's no such thing as a Mumbo's Mountain Lover, let's be honest. So, Freeze Easy Peak has that classic banjo level design, where the level itself revolves around an important central object. In Freeze Easy Peak, it's the snowman. But this trope is used in a number of different levels, such as the tree in TikTok Woods, the mountain in Pterodacty Land, or the tent in Witchy World. They are all very similar in design, only difference is, three of these levels are actually good, and one is not. Anyways, like I said, the snowman is the centerpiece of the level. And this ain't no Mario 64 little baby snowman. This is Banjo-Kazooie Big Papa snowman. This thing is honestly huge. It takes a good 30 seconds to even scale this bad boy. And can we just take a minute to appreciate how fucking creative it is to use the scarf as a means of scaling the snowman? It's 2021, and going up this thing still gets me excited. Rare actually managed to use every part of a traditional snowman in such an interesting way. Like, placing this well-hidden jiggy in his pipe. Or using the other section of the scarf as a ramp for the sleigh. Or the battle arena that takes place on his hat. Or even the buttons on his belly! Almost every part of the snowman is used in some unique and creative way, which makes exploring it, dare I say, snow cool. Okay, that's enough about the snowman. Let's talk about some other parts of the level, like the Christmas tree for example. The Christmas tree is life changing. You will complete this jiggy and walk away a different man. Games will never look the same to you again. Okay, maybe that's a slight exaggeration, but still, this jiggy's really fun. It starts off by you escorting these Christmas lights called Twinklies past the Twink Munchers. Twinkly Munchers! <laughs> Those are two very different things. You do this by attacking the Twinkly Munchers, which will cause them to go back in their holes, allowing the little lights to hop on by. Even letting one Twinkly die on their pilgrimage to the Christmas tree fucks my shit up. It elicits the same feeling as watching one of your Pikmin die and seeing that little ghost raise up. Or finishing off the day and getting back to your ship only to see one dot on your minimap 
realizing you can't get to the Pikmin on time. So, you'll have to watch as the nocturnal creatures of the forest tear it limb from limb before your very eyes. While it looks at you with a face that says, Father, why have you forsaken me? Point is, I like Twinklies. So, once you get them to the tree, a switch pops out in the back. Hit the switch, fly through the star three times, and then grab your jiggy up in the tree. It's challenging, creative, and most importantly, it has Twinklies. Honestly, just an A plus jiggy. Another great jiggy in the level is the walrus race against Boggy the Bear. <sighs> we haven't even talked about this dumb bitch yet. But just wait, I have some things to say about old Boggy Boy. Regardless of how much Boggy sucks, this race is still great. You have to pass through these flades in a specific order, as well as beating old Boggy bitch tits to the finish line. My favorite part about this race is once you beat Boggy as the walrus, you have to beat him again as Banjo. But since Banjo is boring on the line of morbid obesity, you have no chance. You actually have to come back to the level once you've unlocked the turbo trainers and race Boggy again. But this time, you got your Nikes on. I believe this is the only time in Banjo-Kazooie where you have to do something like this. And it's a shame. Okay, I have a confession. I'm one of those weird people that love going back to previous worlds with new abilities to see what I can unlock. I'm also one of those weird people that prefer Banjo-Tooie over Kazooie. <sighs> I know, I know. It's a cross I have to bear. Okay, so let's talk about old Bonky Boy for a second. This bear is such a piece of trash. He is the deadbeat dad of the Banjo-Kazooie universe. When you enter the igloo where his children reside, they tell you that their dad, Boggy, went out to grab them presents, but he never came back. You automatically think that something horrible has happened to a poor Boggy. But nope, he's just a dumb bitch. He was out looking for presents and came across a shiny object, which he then decided to eat. So basically, he has the intelligence of my 10 month old son. This isn't even the worst part. I can forgive stupidity, what I can't forgive is child abuse. So, even after you save Boggy from himself, instead of going back to the Egglu to tend to his distraught children, he channels his inner MJ, says fuck them kids, and grabs his sleigh. <coughs> so then, you're stuck delivering presents for him. He's honestly the one black spot in this otherwise perfect world. He's basically the equivalent of a shit stain in your favorite pair of underwear. So, the last thing I want to quickly touch on is a little something called The Legend of the Ice Key. Everyone who played this level as a kid remembers going into this cave and seeing the spinning ice key through a frozen wall with no actual way to get it. Because there isn't a way to get it. The key was inaccessible in Banjo Kazooie. Now, there was actually a feature called Stoop and Scoop that involved the player having to stoop down and scoop the Banjo-Kazooie cartridge out of the N64 while quickly swapping it with the Tui cartridge. This would allow the player to use the ice heat that was collected in the first game in Banjo-Tooie. The idea was unfortunately scrapped because of the rise in obesity rates in America, especially in gamers. Rare was worried that their overweight fanbase wouldn't be able to stoop down that low to swap out the games. But regardless, the legend of the ice key remained, and it is the big reason why Freeze Easy Peak is such a legendary level. When I say Freeze Easy Peak is a legendary level, I'm not using any hyperbole. This level may be the best level in a franchise that is known for having extraordinary levels. Levels like Treasure Trove Cove, TikTok Wood, Witchy World, and Jolly Rogers Lagoon. All amazing worlds in their own right, but Freeze Easy Peak stands alone. It's one of those rare levels that sticks with you years after playing it. A rare level that turns back the clock and makes you feel like a kid again. If you can't tell by now, this level holds a very special place in my heart. It is one of the main reasons I fell in love with gaming all those years ago. And for that, I can't give it anything less than an S. If you haven't seen our videos reviewing these worlds, I highly recommend you do. But since you're already here, sit back and relax 
as I take you on a journey to a world that's 4,500 years in the making. Pack your sunscreen and bring some water because this vacation will be sure to have you burn it up. It's none other than Gobi's Valley. Or maybe it's Gobi. Gobi's Valley. So you've landed in Gobi's Valley and you're thinking, what should I do first? Well, I got you covered. Let's break down the points of interest in this world and make this an exciting vacation. Matching Puzzle Temple. You remember that matching card game you probably played when you were younger? Where you flip one card and have to flip another card to match it? Well, that's what this temple is all about. It's a classic game with a twist. Instead of cards, you will need to flip these floor panels while avoiding this mummy who just can't get enough of you. Unfortunately, since he's already dead, he won't die, that son of a bitch. But you can temporarily paralyze him. Keep flipping those panels. I can't honestly remember what happens if you don't get a match, but I recommend you avoid that. If you've seen the movie Mummy, then you should already know there will be some booby traps placed around these temples. Match with the tiles and get that jiggy. Copies Island! After leaving Matching Puzzle Temple, I recommend hopping on a magic carpet ride and sailing across the quicksand to Gobby's Island. The only thing harsher than the beating sun and high temperatures in this world is the fact that someone would tie and trap Gobby on his own island. You can't even call it an island, it's a fucking hexagon. But you can change all that and set Gobby free. Simply just break this little sand sculpture and free Gobi and be awarded with another Jiggy. Gobi will waste no time once free and race to find water. Hmm, where could you find fresh water in a world like this? Oasis. Well, if you were paying the slightest bit of attention, you'd remember the oasis at the beginning of the world. This is the first landmark of the world, and it's here you'll meet the thirsty tree trunker. At the beginning, there was not much you could do for this withering man. But remember Gobi? Well, when you set him free, this is where he decided to go. And if he hasn't been through enough shit already, you'll need to beak bust on his hump to expel his water into Tucker. Or Trunker. Pretty sure I've seen shit like that in porn. Trunker will love it and he'll ward you with a jiggy. And Gobi will run away in disgust. Follow that camel into an alcove behind Jinxie's temple and beak bust him again. I'm honestly starting to feel really bad for Gobi. I mean, this is his valley. And he's constantly going through abuse. And this beak bust will be the final straw that broke the camel's back. Gobi decides to leave the world he knows behind for somewhere more relaxing. But don't worry, you'll see Gobi again one day. <laughs> now there are many ways you can get around this world. You can simply relax and take the various magic carpets to avoid touching the hot sands, or while dying in quicksand. You can also learn the Turban Talon Trot from Bottles. In Bubble Boot Swamp, you're able to walk in designer boots. Which, by the way, you can also do in this world. But in this world, you can also run in turbo trainers, allowing you to run at an incredibly fast pace. They were manufactured by Walmart, so don't expect them to last. But for the first time you do have it, it will allow you to run across quicksand. Did you know? This is the last move you learn in the game. But a personal favorite way of mine to travel in this world is flying, of course. A move learned way back in Treasure Trove Cove, simply find this feather panel and soar to the skies. This is the only way to see the magnificent hidden rings of the ancients. Just simply fly through the ring to summon the next ring. Continue the trend until the ancients award you with a jiggy. My own personal opinion, I think it'd be cool if that final ring was a nose ring on this guy. But maybe in the next remastered edition. Speaking of this guy, his name is Jinxie. And just so you know, his nose is stuffed. Feel like playing doctor on your vacation? Well then shoot some eggs into his nostrils. Not only does that clear Jinx's sinuses, but it opens the door between his legs. Figuratively and literally. Come inside! And yes, I spelled that C-U-M. And welcome to... Jinx's temple! In this temple, you'll be doing more magic carpet riding. Who knew all your years of mustache riding would come in handy? To reach the next carpet, just shoot an egg into the sphinx head on the wall and ride your way up to another jiggy. Grab his island! Time to visit another island that's not really an island. Here you'll meet the ancient and seductive Grabba. Now, Grabba may only be a hand wrapped up in sexiness, but he's fast. Very fast. And the only way to grab the golden jiggly from his hand is with the turban trainers. Strap them shoes on, boy, and make a run for the jiggy when Grabba teases you. If you're fast enough, you'll walk away with more golden treasure. Water Pyramid! 
The legends are true. There is in fact a temple in Gobby's Valley filled with water. How that works, I'm not quite sure, but it truly is an experience and a much better water temple than Ocarina of Time. Get into the pyramid likely will be the toughest part of this experience. Once again, strap on those turban trainers, press the switch, and race to the top of the pyramid while the floor door is open. Once you jump in, you'll land in a large pool of water with a jiggy waiting at the bottom. Simply swim down and grab what's rightfully yours. Grabbing this jiggy will set off a series of reactions that will open the front door of the pyramid, allowing all that water to pour out and into the large moat outside of the pyramid. Congratulations. You just provided water to all the native species in this world. Like carnival games? Well, in this moat, you'll notice small pillars. Jump on the one facing a moving sphinx and shoot an egg into the mouth. The sphinx will keep moving, so keep your focus and aim for the wide open hole. As one sphinx goes down, another arises. Keep shooting those eggs into this hungry sphinx hole, and you'll unveil the next point of interest in this vacation package. King Sandy Bust Tomb! Now in entering this cave, you will awaken King Sandy Butt with a message to either turn back or face his wrath. But what's an adventure to Egypt without some risk and danger? Now, despite only three people surviving this excursion, I recommend moving forward into the pyramid. You'll soon find yourself navigating a maze, and you must do it in 59 seconds. I know that might seem intimidating, but I'm sure you've finished other things before in 59 seconds or less. Wink, wink. The reward is definitely worth the risk in this excursion, as you'll get to see the rare and quite honestly, the best part about this world, the gold sarcophagus. And inside, you'll find another jiggy. Ruby's Pyramid! To gain access to this pyramid, you'll need to take to the skies and utilize the back bomb move you learned in Freezy Peak not too long ago, and hit this target, opening yet another front door. Inside this pyramid, you'll meet Ruby. As a player of the Banjo-Kazooie game and going through all this shit for six worlds, let me just say it was refreshing to see a shirtless man. I know the heat and hot sands of Gobby's Valley can make you thirsty, but I was thirsty long before coming to this world. Mm. Anyways, uh, shoot eggs from your behind into the moving pot circling hit steps basket. And once enough eggs have been deposited, the true star of the pyramid will rise, his step. I hope you're not afraid of snakes, because if you want this jiggy, you'll have to climb his step, or just jump on top of the basket before he rises. Honestly, this is a personal favorite excursion of mine. So now time for my personal opinion, because I know we all care so much about it. I kind of love this world. I'm not sure what the general consensus is on Egypt-inspired worlds in Nintendo, but I believe Banner Kazooie does it really well, especially compared to similar themed worlds from different games. There's lots of fun things to do in this world, from exploring different pyramids, flying through rings, and even making new friends. I definitely recommend this world to a friend, and here I am, recommending it to you, which means we must be friends, right? And if we are friends, you should or have already liked and subscribed to this channel. Anyways, I give Gobby Valley an A, and for the low price of 9 jiggies, this could be you. So, here's the thing. Contrary to popular belief, Banjo-Kazooie actually has two horror-themed levels. One goes for shock horror and gore, and is honestly so disturbing it could only be compared to something like Human Centipede or the Saw franchise. The other could best be compared to a Disney Channel original Halloween special. It's not gonna scare you, but it's wholesome as hell and will get you in the Halloween spirit. The level of course I'm referring to is Mad Monster Mansion. Or as I like to call it, mmm. Mad Monster Mansion is a weird one for me. It's a really good level, but for some reason, it never really stuck out to me among the other levels in the franchise. Maybe it's because the spooky monster theme is so overdone in games, or maybe it's because I'm a basic bitch. Oh. I'm not sure. But one thing I can be sure about is that Monster Mansion is a good fucking level. No matter what all those mumble mountain lovers say. The level itself is structured like a typical mansion estate. There's of course the mansion itself, which makes up a decent chunk of the level, but there's also a number of smaller buildings on the estate ground that fill in the rest of the level. Let's quickly go through them all so you can get a good feeling of what this spectacular level is all about. Let's check out the shed first, mainly because it pisses me off the most. So, when you first enter the shed, it seems really cool. It's bright, colorful, there's a ghost roaming around, 
But then you realize something that chills you to your very core. It's just another fucking spelling mini game. As if one wasn't enough, and at least in Treasure Trove Cove, the game gives you the spelling. Like what 10 year old knows how to spell Kazooie? Like where were the spelling mini games in Mario 64? I could fucking spell Mario. The shed is really the only part of the level I actively dislike. Everything else is great, so let's get into some good shit. And the haunted church, let me tell you, is some good shit. Before you enter the church, you can scale this bad boy and find a jiggy sitting on top. This may be a simple jiggy, but there is something just so satisfying about climbing up a big, thick, hard tower. <laughs> no, but seriously, I do love climbing tall shit in video games. So, once you enter the church, it gets even better. As you enter, you're surrounded by giant church pews. Which, can I just say something real quick? It's fucking weird. Because I was under the impression this level was just an ordinary, run-of-the-mill haunted mansion. But apparently fucking giants lived here. I don't know if I missed something in the Banjo-Kazooie manga, where they explained this little lore tidbit, but it just seems so weird. Even though it made zero sense, I'm glad they went this route. Because it's just fun exploring a giant house, how do you shrunk the kid style. And if they didn't, they couldn't have done this sweet ass part with the ghost hand. Mechanically, this jiggy is nothing special. All you're doing is following this hand and hitting the corresponding keys. But it's all about the contents, baby. The fact you're on a giant organ and playing it with a giant ghost hand just makes this jiggy what it is. My favorite part is when you complete this challenge and then you have to scale the giant organ pipes to get your prize. Mmm, that's some good shit. So, the last major building in the level is the mansion. And you know what? The mansion is pretty damn awesome. There are a number of different rooms that make up the mansion, such as the dining room, cellar, bedroom, and the attic. Now, on their own, these rooms aren't anything special. They usually consist of a small square room with one or two collectibles in them. But what is special about these rooms is the way the game makes you feel like you're uncovering a secret every time you find one. You see, like your friendly neighborhood crack house, this shit is boarded up tight. When you first approach the house, there doesn't seem a way to actually enter it. That is, until you start busting shit up and making your own entrances. Need to get to the attic? Bust in the window. Wanna get in the cellar? Bust open that cellar door. Desperate housewife who hates her husband and kids? Bust open this wine barrel and drown away your sorrows. This may seem like a small detail, but it makes the mansion just so much more fun to explore. Honestly though, this scene persists throughout the entire level, not just the mansion. You bust in the bedroom, you bust in the dining room, you even bust in front of a church. <laughs> Rare may have gone a little overboard with all the busting in this level, but honestly, I'm all for it. Because... Busting makes me feel good. Okay, we saved the best for last. We know you've all been waiting for it. Begging for it. So, here it is. The Pumpkin Transformation. Now, I've been on record saying how much I hate transformations that have no useful abilities. But this little pumpkin boy here is the exception. You see, even though he has no abilities to speak of, he can do what small boys do best. Fit in small spaces. And these small spaces are fucking awesome. There's a well, a drain pipe, and you can even get flushed on a toilet. And the best part about getting flushed on this nasty old toilet is after you return, Grunty hits you with this line. A line that can only be described as sexually suggestive. That's what she said. <laughs> The pumpkin transformation makes this level feel even more dense than it already felt. Add on top of that, all the different buildings in the level that can be broken into, and you have a level that's teeming with secrets, and feels like at any point you'll find one around the next corner. And I think that feeling is essential when making a fun level to explore. A good level creates situations that pique your interest. Situations that make you ask questions. Questions like, what happens if I ground pound the cellar door? or stand on this toilet. Mad Monster Mansion makes you ask these questions and almost answers them in a fun and exciting way. It's a good level, 
and a joy to explore, even if it does have a fucking spelling bee game. I'm gonna be hitting Mad Monster Mansion with a B. Where do I even begin with this level? Banjo Kazooie has proven to be a very strong game when it comes to gameplay and design, but like almost every game, there's always that one level that people despise. That one level people know is coming and dread having to play. But Kazooie? That level is Rusty Bucket Bay. Hi! Spoiler alert. I'm just not a fan of this level at all, and this video might just be me shitting all over it. But before I do that, I want to talk about the positives. On paper, I don't actually mind the theme of the level. There's a giant cargo steamship known as the Rusty Bucket, which acts as the focal point of this level. And most of what you do in this level involves navigating on an endless ship. You have to climb all the way to the top of the ship onto the smokestack to collect one jiggy. You have to use the cranes to raise traps for another jiggy, and to drop bombs onto the ship to access a mechanical room to find a giant box for another jiggy. Which, I'm still not sure why there's a giant wooden box down there, but okay. If I was to give any advice to anyone playing this level for the first time, it would be be observant. As a young kid, I definitely was not that. And maybe that's why I sucked so much at this level, and therefore grew to dislike it. But learn from my mistakes. On the side of the ship, you will see numbers which correlate to a code you need to input by the whistles at the stern of the ship to get another jiggy. And of course, there's all the interactive entrances. You can smash through multiple glass windows, you can jump through exhaust pipes to gain access to the ship, but more on that later. Honestly, this level does a good job of getting the cargo port slash bay, whatever you want to call it, themed down. But everything else is a failure in my eyes. A level can't stand on its theme alone to be good. It also has to be fun to play. And I've never had fun playing Rusty Bucket Bay. Ooh, that rhymed. First off, visually, it's so dull and boring. It's like someone just took 50 shades of grey to color this place, and... I'm a visual person, and I love vibrant colors. And you won't find anything colorful here, except maybe this toxic water. Maybe they were trying to be realistic with the colors, as it's a ship surrounded by cargo. But what about Banjo is realistic? I mean, you have a sassy beehive threatening you if you come for her honey. Touch my honey this time or you'll be sorry, bitch. But if you look at most of the best levels in this game, you'll notice color is a big emphasis. And I think that was a miss here. Another big problem I have with this level is just how little fun it is to collect all the jiggies and notes. I'm a perfectionist, and love to get 100% on every level I play. But Rusty Bucket Bay makes it a damn challenge. The notes alone are scattered in so many different and random places. You have to find every room in the ship, go in each cargo box off the side of the ship, random holes in the wall that lead to other areas, this anchor hole, it's just constantly entering holes in all these spaces that are not even fun to explore. It's more tedious than anything. I get that this level is supposed to be hard, since so far the levels have been fairly easy to 100%, but at least make it enjoyable. And I'm sorry, but for one jiggy, what they expect you to do is quite difficult. Dare I say, the hardest in the game? You have to first enter a pipe on the ship that doesn't try to eat you, and hit this fan switch to slow down the ship's engines. Leave the room and break down this door to enter the smokestack. Climb down the long ladder and make your way across this moving platform, and then climb to the top of these moving cogs. Hit both these propeller switches to stop the ship's propellers where a jiggy is chilling behind. Where you have 60 seconds to maneuver your way back through these obstacles, up the ladder, out of the ship, and race to the end, where you must dive and hope that the controls work well enough where you can swim behind the frozen propellers. It's a fucking lot, and as a child, there's no way I have the skill set for that. What makes it even harder is that any second you can fall to your death, and then you're dead. Imagine collecting 80 notes and then you die here, only to have to collect them all over again if you want that treasured 100 notes accomplishment. It's enough to make a grown man rage. And trust me, I've definitely done that in my time. Another tip here though is to definitely get this jiggy out of the way first. And if this level wasn't bad enough, there's a fucking anchor crushing a dolphin! A poor, cute dolphin. That is so cruel. Why couldn't it be, I don't know, boggy? Or anything else? But a dolphin named Snorkel? That's just dark. But at least you get to set him free. I think this is the second animal you set free in this game, and I'm honestly starting to ask questions. I wish I had more positive things to say about Rusty Bucket Bay, but unfortunately, I think it lacks the certain qualities that makes it a fun level. Not only is it visually dull, but it's also dull to play. Sure, there's lots of small different areas hidden to explore, but what makes Banjo levels fun are the environment and interacting with that environment to collect the jiggies. Whether that's pushing the buttons of the snowman, flying through the rings of Gobby's Valley, or even freeing Clanker. 
Rusty Bucket Bay unfortunately lacks in that department, and collecting the Jiggies in this level is more of a chore. This is probably the only level where I'd be okay not collecting all 100% of the Jiggies and notes, and that's saying something. But on a positive note, if it weren't for levels like Rusty Bucket Bay, then I wouldn't have the same appreciation I do for the levels I really love, and know not to take for granted. I also like this little hidden nod to Treasure Trove Cove. Take note, Rusty Bucket. At the end of the day, I can't help but give Rusty Bucket Bay a D. The changing of seasons in video games is generally relegated to lifestyle type games like your Animal Crossings, Harvest Moons, or Stardew Valleys. Those types of games usually take place over the course of months or even years, and the changing of the seasons helps portray a sense of progression to the player. But what happens when a game developer just says screw it and decides to butt the trend and does something a little crazy? What if they added seasons to a 3D platformer? Well, put on those rain boots, slip on that speedo, bust out that leaf blower, and grab your sleigh, because today, we'll be experiencing all four seasons in a little level called Click Clock Woods. So, as I mentioned in a previous video, Flip Flop Woods has a classic banjo level design, where the level revolves around a central object. In Clip Clop Woods, that central object is this big old tree, and let me tell you, I love this goddamn tree. There is just something so cool about climbing up a giant ass tree. Giant ass tree? You use these cutout sections of the tree to make your way to the top. And ugh, these sections are just so aesthetically pleasing. Rare could have just easily made a series of ladders and floating platforms as a means of scaling the tree, but they went with these woodpecker style cutouts instead, and I'm so glad they did. It just gives the tree so much character. And honestly, using floating platforms is just lazy. Rare would never stoop to that level. They would never just have random platforms in the air with no context on why they are there or how they're being held up. I'm sorry, but these fucking platforms bother the shit out of me. They put all this effort to give everything used to scale the tree some kind of context, like the cutouts or the branches, then they just decide to shit out these generic wooden platforms and have them floating in thin air. So, aside from these catastrophes, the tree is actually really great. It actually has the honor of winning my prestigious, bushiest tree award for the best tree level in gaming. So, as awesome as this big ass tree is, it's only one portion of what makes this level so good. The other is the portion I was alluding to earlier in the video, the seasons. So, Click Cock Woods' main gimmick is the changing of the seasons as you progress to the level. When you first enter TikTok Woods, you are greeted with a central hub, which consists of a circular room with four different doors, each corresponding to one of the four seasons. However, the only door that is open to you is Spring, so you're forced to start your journey there. And honestly, Spring is a great place to start. The music, first off, is absolutely boppin'. It instantly gets you excited and makes you feel like, damn girl, Spring has sprung! And so is my dick, cause I love this level. Huh? It really makes you want to explore this lush green world. With overflowing rivers, giant flowers, tree forts, and baby birds. Everything about this section of dipped up woods just screams spring and I love it. So, once you've explored spring enough, you'll come across a switch at the top of the tree with the sun on it. Hit the switch, and the summer section of Dick Dock Woods will unlock in the main hub. And this right here is where the level really starts to hit its stride. As you enter summer, you'll notice there's been a couple changes around these woods. The music has changed to fit a more summery vibe. The once overflowing rivers have been dried up by the hot sun. The half-built tree fort is nearly complete. The baby bird that you so lovingly and gently hatched from its egg is now asking for food. And the giant flower grown from your butt eggs is now waiting to be watered. 
And by the way, what is up with these butt eggs? Like, I don't get it. Is shitting eggs out your ass supposed to be funny? It's not a fun ability to use, and it's used so sparingly that I honestly forget it exists half the time. I will guarantee you there is not one Banjo fan out there that enjoys this ability. Let me know in the comments if you are pro or against butt eggs. As I was saying before I went off the rails there, it's the changes that each season brings that really differentiate this level from others in the series. Each time you enter a new season, the level changes in a way that makes it exciting to explore again, even though you're basically treading the same ground. And it creates situations where things you do in previous seasons will have an effect on the later seasons. Like when you finally get to fall, that butt flower you've been tending to the past couple seasons will finally bloom, granting you a jiggy. I'm more of a booby flower guy than a butt flower guy personally. <laughs> And when you get to winter, that baby bird you've been feeding is all grown up and will shit this jiggy out for you. Honestly, good for Kazooie. That girl will put anything in her mouth. There's also the Naughty Beaver Saga, where you have to help poor Naughty remove this boulder from in front of her house. Then, come back and fall once the water levels have returned to normal and collect your prize. Side note. Naughty the Beaver also won my even more prestigious Bushiest Beaver Award for the best beaver in gaming. Honestly, who doesn't like a bushy beaver? Especially one that's a little naughty. Fun fact, Naughty is also the name of the beavers in Donkey Kong Country. Honestly, the only real criticism I have for the level is the fact that you have to collect worms for this baby bird not once, but twice. And same for this slutty ass squirrel and his acorns. Also, Rare, what the fuck is up with these animations? Shit's just falling through the floor left and right. This is some jank ass shit, bitch. There are people who will state you're essentially playing the same level four separate times and that Click Clock Woods feels small because of it, especially considering it's the game's final world. And to those people I would say, first off, how dare you? And second, even though all four seasons share the same geometry, it never feels like you're playing the same level. Each season is changed up just enough where it feels fresh and exciting every time you hop into a new one. Like how everything in winter is covered in ice, making it hard to navigate. Or how the river in summer is dried up, making falls deadlier. Add on top of that the fact that the level progresses as you move from season to season, and you have a level that is truly unique. Not just in the Banjo franchise, but in the 3D platforming genre as a whole. In a level that revolves around the concept of change, I find it funny that my feelings have always stayed the same. Slab this bitch up with an ass! Well, there you have it. We've now covered every single level in Banjo-Kazooie. From the mediocre mountains of Mumbles Mountain, to the ever-changing seasons of Click Clock Woods, and everything in between. It's been a journey, but going back and playing these levels made me realize just how special this game is. It's without a doubt one of the greatest 3D platformers of all time, and I just hope we did it justice with our videos. 